This is a response to Sequester Zone and his video entitled Atheism and Ethics. He is one of Thunderfoot's critics, so I was going to suggest that he take the challenge in my Moral Bewilderment video. I tried to make a comment to that effect on one of his videos, but it seems that I am blocked from his channel, although I have never had any interactions with him. So that is kind of strange, but anyway, if anyone knows Sequester Zone, please let him know about this video response. I decided to respond to one of the earlier videos in his catalog because he did attempt to lay out a moral theory, although I don't think he did a very good job, but at least he made the effort. So in this video, I'm going to critique that moral theory and that video. So here we go. Take it away, Sequester Zone. As an atheist, I've noticed something kind of odd. Since religious people like to claim that their morality is objective and based on God, most atheists seem to counter that by saying that morality is either completely subjective or based on science. I'll discard the science for now, but I personally think it's a trap that atheists fall into when they argue that their morality is subjective or just a matter of opinion. This whole thing about masturbation and morals is completely ridiculous. First of all, morals is subjective. The reason religious ethics fails in the first place is because it's subjective. Secular ethics are actually more objective. Religious people base their arguments on their holy book and on discrimination against certain groups of people. Take this religious argument, for example. What they're doing here is not using God to argue for morality. They're taking the belief in objective morality and using it to argue for God. That is why attacking premise two is a mistake that many atheists make. The real problem here is with premise one. Plato questioned this kind of thinking before there was even a Jesus to misinterpret. Things are either good because God wills it, or God wills them because they are good. Neither of these result in God's ethics being objective. The reason why theists use that argument against atheism is that they know that most people simply take morality for granted. The theist argument is really a challenge to atheists to define morality without God. It's a way of showing that the typical atheist worldview rests on unquestioned assumptions, just like the typical religious worldview. God is the first domino that should fall to skepticism, but it is not the last. However, most atheists, like you, want to remove God and keep all of their other unquestioned assumptions intact. But skepticism opens up a Pandora's box. If you demand justification for belief in God, then it is reasonable for someone else to expect you to provide a similar justification for your other beliefs. And most atheists simply can't do that. Belief in God does provide a basis for objective morality in the following way. Good is defined as the will of God. So you define it as the will of God. It's not that God does things because they are good, or that things are good because God wills them. Good is defined as the will of God. Morality is conforming to God's judgments and obeying God's will. In this view, morality is subjective because it is in the mind of God, but it is also objective because God is a unique special subject. That's how religion solves the problem of making morality objective. It assumes a unique special subject. Of course, in doing that, religion simply packs morality into the concept of God. That is one of the main functions of the God concept in the religious worldview. It is a box into which people put problems that they don't want to deal with. They put the assumptions of their worldview into a box, they label the box God, and they put it on a shelf out of sight. God ties up all the loose ends very neatly into one concept, which is then unquestioned. This is a dodge. It's not a solution. Philosophy requires that we open up that box 
and take out all of those assumptions and examine them. And that's why philosophy is a big task. It's like untangling the Christmas lights. The correct atheist counter-argument is the flying spaghetti monster argument. I could say that I believe in the flying spaghetti monster, and the flying spaghetti monster wants me to eat spaghetti on Tuesdays and Thursdays. And that's written in a book somewhere, so I know it's true. Then my definition of morality is obeying the will of the flying spaghetti monster. It is based on my faith in the flying spaghetti monster. It's a parody of the religious worldview, and it demonstrates the ad hoc nature of that worldview. In the 18th century, philosopher David Hume destroyed every moral theory that was popular at the time. He destroyed the idea that morality was based on God, science, or egoism. Hume did such a good job destroying every moral theory that he then had to argue whether ethics existed at all. Hume concluded that eth we know ethics exists because we have moral intuitions, which are shared by most of the human race. A person without moral intuitions, Hume concluded, was like a colorblind person who could not see color. We might all have moral intuitions, but that would not imply that they refer to something objective and universal, something that exists independent of human minds. Intuitions are subjective. Just because we recognize some things as morally bad and others as morally good does not imply that those categories refer to something outside our minds. And even if they do represent something outside our minds, they could still depend on perspective. Consider a rainbow. You see a rainbow in the sky because light is reflected and refracted through water droplets from that angle. The light appears to originate from a certain place in the sky where the raindrops are. But you don't see a rainbow as a bunch of raindrops. You see it as a gestalt an arc of colors. The perception of a rainbow depends on perspective. Different people standing in different positions will see the rainbow in different places. Is a rainbow objective? What aspect of reality does the perception of a rainbow represent? Another example is language. The English language exists outside the mind of any one person, yet it does not exist outside the minds of all people. The English language was not there floating in space before people started to speak it. It emerged within culture, and it evolves over time. The English language exists only within a cultural context. Morality is similar. It exists only within a cultural and social context. Morality is conformity to cultural norms and submission to social power. That's what it actually is. It is not objective and universal. It is culturally and socially relative. Hume argued that nihilism was unlivable. He gave many examples of why this was the case. But one of the best examples I ever came across was when a professor of mine told me that if a student of his wrote a paper arguing for nihilism, he would give him an F, no matter how good the paper was. This was not him being a dick, as some people have suggested. This was him showing the logical paradox of nihilism. If someone gives you an F, no matter how good your paper is, then the only thing you can do is express your idea that this is wrong. This is a moral value. If your argument is that you are a nihilist, and then you express no moral value by saying this is wrong, then you have admitted you deserve an F. There is no logical paradox in arguing for moral nihilism. There is a kind of paradox in arguing for pure nihilism, but even then it would not follow that the student deserves an F because he argued for nihilism. First of all, let's be clear what nihilism is and what moral nihilism is, because those are two different things. Pure nihilism is the rejection of any context of interpretation or standard of judgment. It's a complete rejection of meaning, truth, and value. Moral nihilism is merely the rejection of a unique standard for moral judgments. 
Making an argument for pure nihilism is paradoxical because the argument rejects any standard by which it might be judged. It even rejects a context in which it could be interpreted as meaningful. It's like saying language has no meaning or this statement is false. Those statements are paradoxical because they deny the existence of a context in which they could be interpreted or judged. But just because nihilism is paradoxical, it doesn't mean that a student who hands in a paper arguing for pure nihilism deserves an F. A paradox of that kind is not a logical contradiction. It is not necessarily false. It is an undecidable proposition, not a logical contradiction. Now, if the professor accepts the student's argument for pure nihilism, what it implies is that the professor does not accept any standard by which he could judge the student's argument as correct or incorrect. He would have no basis for giving it any grade, whether it's an A, B, C, D, or an F. So there is a paradox to pure nihilism, but there is no paradox to moral nihilism. Making an argument for moral nihilism is not paradoxical unless the argument is a moral argument. If your argument is based on a moral standard and it denies the existence of a moral standard, well then there would be a bit of a paradox to that. For example, if you said, I reject morality because morality is bad, that would be paradoxical. But if the student appeals to some other standard, such as rationality, then there is no paradox. Let's consider this situation where the professor gives the student an F for handing in a paper on moral nihilism. You say that the student would have to appeal to a moral standard to argue for a better grade. But I disagree. The student could appeal to a non-moral standard by which philosophy papers are typically marked the standard of rationality. Now you might say, ah, but the professor has no moral obligation, according to the student, to administer that standard. And well, that is true that according to the student's argument, the professor is not morally obliged to apply that standard in judging the student's paper. However, that is true regardless of what argument the student makes, because nobody is morally obliged to do anything. So if you accept the student's argument, the professor is not morally obligated to grade any paper in any particular way whatsoever. But that doesn't mean that there's no standard to which the student can appeal. He could appeal to the professor's self-interest. Suppose the student was an attractive young woman. She could go into the professor's office, unbutton her blouse, pull down her bra, exposing her breasts, lean over his desk, look him deep in the eyes, and say, I'd really appreciate it if you would take another look at my paper on moral nihilism. If you don't, I'm going to walk out of here like this, crying. I'll give you 10 seconds to decide. See, that would be a very compelling argument. The professor would discover that morality is neither necessary nor sufficient to control human behavior. Human relationships are ultimately governed by power, power within a social context. Like the law, morality is a useful illusion, but without power to back it up, it is meaningless about and, and applied it's clear to me that morality is a subjective thing and it's it's puzzling to me how any honest observant person can think that anything else is possibly the case i think steve is a really smart guy but he's wrong about this i'm going to start laying the groundwork for objective ethics right here the first two things you need to have ethics are reason and empathy Ethics do not work without these two things. They are absolutely crucial. 
Some people would say that empathy is not objective because it's about emotions, but almost everyone has the capacity for empathy, and even some animals have exhibited it. Yes, almost everyone has the capacity for empathy, but what is empathy? Empathy is a partial identification with another subject. It can be based on emotional signals or imagining yourself in the position of the other. Emotional signaling generates a stronger subconscious kind of empathy, but it depends on seeing a face. Imagination creates a weaker kind of empathy, but one that is cognitively richer. That's the kind of empathy you experience when you identify with the protagonist of a novel. You imagine yourself seeing the world through his eyes. In some sense, you put yourself mentally into his mind. Empathy can make us nice to others in certain situations, but empathy is not indiscriminate and it can be positive or negative. Positive empathy makes us help others Negative empathy makes us hurt others. Whether you feel positively or negatively towards someone depends on your perceived relationship to that person. We empathize positively with family members, friends, and members of our social group. We empathize negatively with outsiders and enemies, or in other words, with everyone else. So the default empathy is negative. We actually feel negatively toward most people and positively toward a select few. Societies use the mechanism of empathy to mobilize hatred against outsiders. In fact, empathy magnifies hatred because emotional synchronization via emotional signaling acts to amplify shared emotions. If two people are together and they identify with each other, then they tend to mirror each other's emotions. So if one gets angry, the other tends to get angry. And there's a feedback loop that amplifies that anger. That's how crowds become angry mobs. People synchronize their emotions by empathy with one another until they share a very strong common emotion, which is usually hatred of outsiders. To be an individual and to retain your autonomy of belief and action, you have to avoid excessive identification with others, especially with groups. Otherwise, you will be swept along with the crowd and you will lose your autonomy of belief and action to the crowd. Now there are things that we have agreed upon in every society that are impermissible. And one of the chief things is murder. Now, I'm not saying killing, because killing can be justified under certain circumstances. But I'm using the word murder, which by its definition is the unjustified killing of another human being. There is no society that has ever condoned murder. If a person was willing to make the argument that murder should be permissible, there is a logical paradox in that they are giving you permission to murder them. So we take as our first universal maxim that human life is inherently valuable. Um, there is no paradox in claiming that murder is morally permissible, but it's also a fallacy that if someone rejects morality, that they are claiming that murder is morally permissible. What they are doing is rejecting the framework of moral rights and obligations entirely. So they are saying nothing is morally permissible or impermissible. You are making the same kind of fallacy here as confusing atheism with Satanism. Amorality is not immorality. Okay. And the reason you're making this confusion is because you can't think outside the box of moral assumptions. You just can't imagine not having moral assumptions. You, just like a religious person can't imagine a worldview that doesn't include God, you can't imagine a worldview that doesn't include morality. 
So when someone has that worldview, you interpret it as they have a moral worldview, but they're just on the side of evil instead of on the side of good. But that's not the case. Let's say, though, that a person gives you moral permission or even social permission to kill him. He just says, yeah, come at me, bro. People do that all the time. Uh, it's called fighting. <laughs> Have you ever been in a street fight? That's what it is. Two people agree to conflict. There is no paradox to that. It's just that sometimes people would prefer to fight. They might prefer conflict to cooperation. So there's no paradox and you're committing a fallacy. Now some people might bring up that there have been societies that have killed large numbers of people and it been accepted. But when this happens, it is usually under the assumption by this society that the people who are being victimized are not full human beings, are not equal to other human beings. And when I bring up these other maxims, you will find that the people who have been denied these things by different societies are usually people not considered equal to the people in power. Well, many societies have killed large numbers of people in the past, mainly because that's kind of a necessity of existence on this planet. The excess human population has to be killed off one way or the other. And what happens is eventually people get pretty good at surviving in nature and extracting energy from the environment. So the population grows and grows and grows until they reach the carrying capacity of the environment. Then it becomes a zero sum game because there's no additional energy to extract from the environment. And that's when societies tend to either conquer new lands or collapse due to civil unrest. Societies go to war in order to get the resources that are necessary to support their growing populations. And also, it's just the way societies work. They try to take over territory and expand because if they don't, someone else takes them over. It's the law of nature. Societies exist within nature, so they are governed by the rules of nature. And nature does not have moral rules. Nature does not play by your morality. In nature, the strong destroy the weak. That's the law of nature. So that's why societies kill people. Um, now, how do they justify it? How do they internally mobilize their population to do that? Well, what they do is they use that empathy mechanism. They define the people that they want to annihilate as outsiders and enemies. So they generate negative empathy against those people and they use that to mobilize their population against those people. But that doesn't mean that they don't view them as human. The Greek city-states would often go to war against other Greek city-states and the winners would kill, rape, and enslave the losers. But they did not think that the losers were not human. They recognized them as fellow Greeks. Under different circumstances, they would have allied with them or had uh, trade relationships with them or other kinds of friendly relationships. And I'm pretty sure you could marry people from other city-states and so on. So it wasn't that they didn't view them as human. It's just that they sometimes would end up fighting them because conflict is part of life. They understood that nature is ultimately competitive and that cooperation is limited to certain special contexts where we can create positive sum exchanges. Anyway, I'm going to end this here. I think I've gone through the, some of the main points. There's a lot more to his video, but I've rambled on more than enough. So thanks for listening if you made it this far.